Thank you everyone for being here. My name is Charmaine Mendez, Adult Services Librarian from the Moreno Valley Public Library. This virtual author showcase is sponsored by the Moreno Valley Friends of the Library, so big thanks to them. A few announcements before we begin. As a reminder, uh, all your microphones are muted and your videos turned off to respect your privacy because this presentation is being recorded. If you have any questions for a presenter, leave them in the chat and I'll get, to the, get them to him or feel free to unmute your microphone at the end to ask a question then if you prefer. Now I'll introduce our special guest. James O'Harris Jr. is the author of the children's book, Welcome to the Adventures of Corey's Courtroom. He can be found reading to children at elementary schools and libraries around the Inland Empire and doing virtual Zoom events like this one. He conducts workshops and seminars throughout Southern California. Currently, he is the library commissioner, chairman for the city of Moreno Valley and a member of the Moreno Valley Scribes. He currently resides in Moreno Valley, California with his wife of 29 years and is the proud father of two. Today's presentation is part of James Harris's African American history series called Unveiled, which includes presentations of the Green Book, Sundown Towns, Robert Smalls, The Great Migration, Redlining, Pullman Porters, and Restrictive Covenants. Everyone, please welcome our guest speaker for tonight, James Harris. Thank you for being here, James. Here we go. Welcome to another episode of Unveiled History in Focus featuring Maggie L. Walker. Hello, everyone. My name is James Harris, and I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. And I'm going to welcome you to another episode of Unveiled. Uh, before we get started, I have a few folks I want to thank. First, I want to thank the Moreno Valley Public Library and the Moreno Valley Friends of the Library for hosting me tonight. I also want to thank Ms. Charmaine. She's doing a great job for uh, facilitating tonight. She also put together the social media advertisement as well as the flyer. So I want to thank you. Uh, thank you, Charmaine. But also, and more importantly, I just want to thank everyone who showed up and uh, logged on tonight. Uh, I really appreciate your participation because I know you took time out of your schedule to, uh, to be here. So I, I just want to say thank you. Uh, it's interesting because tonight, what we're gonna learn about is a phenomenal woman who had the audacity to have a vision of a bank, a store, and a newspaper during Jim Crow and placed right in the middle of the Confederate South of the uh, Virginia, Richmond, Virginia. And so this is a phenomenal story of, of this young lady. And so sit back, relax. We're gonna have an entertaining time. And I want you just to think about this woman we're about to uh, unveil together. And we're going to do that because you can, you can bank on it. Before we get started, uh, before we find out how Maggie became Maggie, let's kind of give a little uh, background of how she got there. Maggie was born to her mother, Elizabeth Draper, on July 15, 1864. Her biological father was Excel Cobreff, and he was Irish born, um, an Irish born immigrant who, as you, can, as you can see, you know, he was white, but he was also a newspaper man as well as a soldier. Maggie's mother was a maid for Elizabeth Van Loo. Uh, so, and we're gonna talk about Elizabeth Van Loo in a moment, but Excel, according to our documents, they weren't, they were, they were never married but they had a child because someone had asked me, uh, well, how come if Elizabeth, Maggie's mother is so dark, how could Maggie be so light? Well, that's the reason because her father was, um, was, Irish, was, was Irish born. And so Elizabeth, her mother was, bo was uh, born, as a, as born in the house of Elizabeth Van Loo. She was amazed for her. And so because of the two races, they couldn't actually be together. So Maggie actually grew up African-American and she was subject to all the rules, burdens, and restrictions of the Jim Crow, Jim Crow South. 
And so, so before we move on, I wanted to kind of give you a little idea about Elizabeth Van Loo, the, May, uh, the person that her mother worked for. Elizabeth Van, Van Loo was an abolitionist. And so someone had asked me, well, well what is an abolitionist? Well, an, an abolitionist is someone who uh, wanted the abolishment of practices and institutions of, of, of slavery. And so during that time, uh, uh, Maggie's mother, Elizabeth, she was an ex-slave. She was an ex-slave. So what happened here is that Miss uh, Elizabeth Van Loo took her in and had her, had her be a servant for her. But during the war, Miss Van Loo was actually a spy for General Grant. And so as you can see, she would hide um, different uh, soldiers, give them food, assistance, uh, tell them what was going on in, in Richmond, Virginia. And so she was very instrumental in helping um, the war effort. And so I just kind of put a, a little side note is that who Miss, uh, who Maggie was, Maggie's mother was actually working for. Well, during this time that she was in the, uh, the mansion with the Van Loos, uh, she got married again. Actually, she got married for the first time. She got married to uh, William, William Mitchell. And he was actually a butler at the time during, uh, during this time. He had worked with her and they had had a love affair. And so they ultimately together, they had a, a child together named, named Johnny because he was so well um, versed at, at his job and he knew what he wanted to do. He ended up working at a very prestigious, um, I guess, hotel restaurant where they did, did very well there to the point that the whole family could move from the Van Loo's house and move into their own house in Virginia. They were doing very well. Here, however, in 1876, um, Maggie's stepfather was found murdered in the James, uh, James River, unfortunately. Uh, during those times, it wasn't uncommon to find African-American men, you know, murder. Of course, when they tried to do an invoice and try to find out exactly what was going on and inquiry was trying to go on with happened to him, a homicide, uh, they said that he had committed suicide. But actually, everybody in the area believed that it was, a, it was a homicide. So to make a living, her mother washed clothes and her brother Johnny uh, delivered laundry to help the family survive. And so uh, obviously that when you lose... Um, a major income, the family had to go through a lot of financial hardships. And so what you're gonna see through this whole presentation is that Maggie always had a quote that she thought about and actually did. And so here one was, I was not born with a silver spoon in my mouth, but a laundry back basket practically on my head. That was because when her mother actually washed her clothes, her brother and her and herself would go and actually press them and then uh, d deliver them. But what this did was, and you're gonna start to see, you can start to see just how this shaped her personality and how she thought about finances and how she wanted to be uh, more than what she was at the time. I just wanna show you this real quick. This was the brother, her half brother, I guess you could say her half brother from William Mitchell because you know her father was um, Col Colbeth. And so this is her brother, uh, Johnny. And so they were the ones who would carry on all the different uh, laundry to the, to, to the households. Even though um, slavery was over, and this was, a, this was the first time that the first generation of African-Americans can actually go to a public school. So uh, when Maggie was going through the school, what they taught her was things that she had never heard before terms like financial responsibility, financial um, parity, uh, thriftiness, cooperation, unity. So all these things start to filter in to her psyche, to what she wanted to be, because she had a natural uh, acclimate towards numbers. And so at the end of her school year, school year term, Maggie and her high school classmates pr protested the Richmond Theater because they couldn't graduate from there, but the whites could. And so this actually became one of the first um, 
nation's school, school protests. And so what they said was this, if our African-American tax dollars are going to fund that theater, then we should have just as much right to graduate from the theater as our white counterparts. But what would happen is that the white counterparts would have to would graduate from the theater, but the uh, African-Americans always had to graduate at a church or another, or another venue. And so they protested and so they lost. But what this set the stage was for, for Maggie in her mind, understanding how economics and how money actually plays a part uh, in your life and, and how you are to move in society. Uh, what you see here is her diploma. And I thought it was interesting. It says, the Richmond Colored Normal School. And when I first thought about that, I was like, okay, if there was a Richmond Colored Normal School, was there a Richmond Colored Abnormal School? And who went to that? But I just thought that was kind of just interesting. So, um, but she was, she was starting to shape her personality and understanding how finances could affect her and her life. After high school, Maggie became a school teacher for three years, but she also studied accounting and, and other uh, accounting terms and classes in order to get you know, all the things that she needed to, uh, to make money. And so the interesting thing about that is that uh, there are some people that had to have a natural inclination towards finance. Well, Maggie was, part, was one of those. Well, what happened is, is that she would work she would work and go to class and she kept getting better and better at managing money and at understanding how actually actually money worked. And so once again, you hear um, another uh, quote for her because she said, if you can read and write, then you can go anywhere and do anything you can write to win. And this is what she taught her students. And she, what she was trying to teach them was thriftiness, cooperation, money, reading, understanding. And she started teaching all the young African-American kids in her community finances and how to actually man, man, manage money. And so that community was starting to grow and have a financial sense of how actually money worked. So um, Maggie, she worked hard. She worked hard at trying to get her, uh, her students to understand how, you know, Money, money actually work. Okay, well let's let's keep going. Well, doing the um, as she was uh, going through school and she was working, um, Maggie became nineteen, and Maggie married Armstead Walker in nineteen eighty six. That's how Maggie Draper became Maggie Walker because she didn't take her uh, stepfather's name of Mitchell; she took her um, husband's name and uh, Walker in eighteen nineteen eighty six. However, uh, she had to stop working due to social norms and the school policy. Back then, they had reserved the jobs were reserved for single women because what they figured was if you were a married woman, then you had income or someone to uh, to provide. So if you're a single if you're a single woman and you got married, then you had to give up your job. Interesting, huh? So the school policy said she had to get married so she couldn't work. So therefore she concentrated and just on raised her family. And that's uh, Armstead. And she loved him. He was a brick construction worker. And uh, they were just doing, doing very well. Maggie had three sons. She had Russell, Melvin, and Armstead. Uh, unfortunately, Armstead died within a year of birth. They also, Adopted a distant relative Polly. And you can see her, her on the side there. So she was happy uh, at this time being a mother and a wife, but there was a drive in her that kept pushing her to be more. And so she just kept uh, just kept thinking about, okay, you know what? I there, there's more to me than this. And she she loved it, but there's more to her than that. So she just kept 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 going, kept working. Well, at 14. Project and Mary through her church, she uh, was part of, they had her become a part of uh, the Independent Order of St. Luke. The Independent Order of St. Luke was an organization uh, uh, came to existence after the Civil War. 
um, and it was a fraternal order, so it was men led, and it was helped with insurance, the funeral costs, and uh, community support. Because you have the mirror back in the day after 19, 1865, when the um, slavery was over, there were no resources for African Americans. If you had to bury somebody, if you needed money for it or, or for, for anything. So you always had to um, kind of look around. Well, this independent order of St. Luke. As you can see here, it says the most progressive and substantial fraternal order organization in, in, in the country. And so they believed in just trying to bring in unity and, and um, help, help, help the African American community. And what she saw was this organization that actually could help, could help, and uh, she wanted to help. So she ultimately ended up working for the Independent Order of St. Luke. And this started to set the stage for, her, for the rest of her life. While she was working, she established juvenile division that stressed the principles of pride, business, and cooperation. She believed that the future of success depended on investing in our youth. And so those were the principles that she would, for the rest of her life, uh, build her pillars on, of pride, and she's called a race pride, thriftiness, and cooperation, which was always unity. And she believed in the youth. That's why she taught them. And all the pictures that you'll see if you look her up later on, she's always with young folks and, um, and, uh, and women. Because what she said was, and here's another quote, she says, as a twig, twig is bent, the tree is inclined. And what she was basically saying is that if we can infuse in our youth those values that will help them in the future, then the whole race as a whole will have those same values and we can go forward. Cute little guys. In 1899, the order was on the verge of bankruptcy. It had $31 in the bank, and its membership was dwindling. Because it was a fraternal order, it was led by men. And so Maggie, she had worked her way up to the right worthy council uh, secretary. And so when they, when they said, OK, I think we need to step down, where others saw failure, she actually saw an opportunity. And so she stepped up. And so she was elected to the right grand secretary and the treasurer because she was so good with understanding how money, money works. And so she had a vision. She had a vision of a newspaper, a bank, and a store. Because in her mind, she, she felt the only way to advance was through the financial independence. Because at that time, I remember we were doing Jim Crow, and you couldn't go to a bank to get a bank loan for a house. You couldn't uh, have your, um, your voices heard at the newspaper. And you couldn't really go to any stores. And so she said, all right, you know, I, I want to do something different. And as you can see, that was a daring move back in 1899. It wasn't at the turn of the century. So that this is a little badge that she got. It said Maggie L. Walker, RWC, that's a white right um, wing uh, council secretary, and Richard Virginia. And so she became president at this time because none of the men were, were stepped up. In 1902, she found the St. Luke Herald newspaper in order to tell her story of civil rights and the plight of the American people. Because what she was finding is that she wanted to get her, her word out and our word out and the uh, African-American word out, what she had to do was she had to have her own newspaper. So she established the St. Luke Herald. And so everything that was going on in town or around the country or that she needed to get the word out, she could actually use this uh, vehicle to make it happen. And she would employ over 30 women to work, whether it be in typewriters, uh, typist, or um, all kinds of different functions within the, within the uh, or organization. Uh, some, some were bookkeepers, but some was even stenographers. And so what she did was she gave employment to uh, people who may not have had it before. And so she said, okay, so this is in 1902, two years after she first said 1899, I want to start out, I'm gonna start a con conglomerate. She found the newspaper. In 1903, she actually founded the bank. The bank was founded in the famous uh, Jackson Ward in Virginia. And what you can see here is you can see some of the people that, um, that worked for her. In the very middle, you see, you see Maggie and two of her employees, and uh, you see her picture up there. And on the sides, you can see the women. 
And in uh, the picture to my right, she, she was uh, the president at that time. And everybody listened to her, which was unheard of back in those days. But when it comes down to dollars and cents and someone who can actually manage it, you put the best person in the, in the uh, in at the time. And so what, I, what even happened is that she, she did so well, the bank ended up ballooning to half a million dollars in her bank and over 100,000 members, 24 uh, states wide. Everybody started phoning in because they're like, you know what, this is somebody that can actually, actually help us. I love this. Her motto was, let us put our money together let us have a bank that would take the nickels and turn them into dollars, Maggie Walker. And what's interesting about that quote is that is more than a quote, is a financial state of mind. Because what she was really saying was, all right, let's take our nickels and turn them into dollars. She saw money as a tool to make more money. She didn't look at it as, okay, let's get some money and as a consumer. She saw it as a as a tool to help her grow an empire. And so that was a, a really important mindset back then when she said, okay, we can do this, but we need to do this together. Let us, let us put, let us put our monies together and let us have a bank that would take the nickels and turn them into dollars. And so I thought that was a really important concept when you even think about it now, about unity and how you can come together, what you can actually achieve if you put your money together and you have us us in there. Uh, here are some of the staff of the uh, at the Emporium. Here's the Bank Emporium and, and her residence. And we're going to talk about those a little bit later. If you see, if you see uh, at the corner there, it's the staff at the Emporium. Out of 18 people, 11 were women because she she believed in uh, hiring women. And you, some of the faces at the bottom. There were very young, young children as well, because she was always trying to have the community come in and learn about finances and learn how to run business and understand, understand terms. In the corner up there, that was her, uh, that was her store. And we'll speak about that in a minute. But that was the only store uh, at that time. And it was, it was um, sat right in the middle of Broad Street. Broad Street, it was right in the middle of uh, Virginia and only the whites could actually go there. If the blacks went to the shop, they would have to go to the back and they couldn't try and enclose or do anything. So she sat that in defiance of Jim Crow right in the middle of Broad Street. And if you can see through that picture, she had, um, they were, it was immaculate and everybody was always immaculately dressed. And they even had African-American mannequins. I was looking around the stores of the day and I couldn't find an African-American mannequin, but she had that back in 1904 back in the 1900s. And so she said, all right, well, first uh, we have a newspaper, we're gonna get our voice out. And then she said, all right, we're gonna look at a, um, a bank and we're gonna look at a store. But she didn't, she didn't stop there because in 1904, after she, had her, after she had her store, she organized a boycott against the, a trolley car system in Virginia. After two years of walking, the company went bankrupt and they won. But someone asked, well, why is that significant? I know that's, that's a really a good, a good thing, but why is that significant? Because if you look at the, uh, the bus boycotts of 1956, uh, when Martin Luther King uh, held that boycott after Rosa Parks refused to give up a seat, they had the boycott. That, would, that, that went on for a year. That went on for actually a year. And so what you can see is a direct lineage from what Maggie did back in the day to what they did in civil rights in 1956, because they went two years without walking. They went two years um, walking without uh, getting on a trolley until the actual company went broke. Because once again, she's thinking, you know what, we're gonna have our tax dollars here. Um, we're gonna make sure that uh, they go where we want them to go. And so one of her quotes was, every legislator in the South legislates against the Negro our self-respect respect demands we walk. And, and they did. For two years, they walked until the company went out of bankrupt and then they finally won and then they finally got the right to ride the bus. When I was thinking about her, um, her, her store, she, she had a quote that I thought was really, really interesting and, and spoke about the time. So this, this is a quote from her. So I just want you to listen about how she thought about money and how she thought about her 
her store. She says, every time you set foot in a white man's store, you are making the line of prejudice stronger and stronger and making it all the more easy for him to devour the Negro merchant who's trying to do business. The only way to kill the line of race prejudice is to stop feeding him. So she was using that same analogy of the lion and how you had to stop feeding the lion in order to get what, of, of what you want. And so she said, okay, we need to stop um, uh, feeding uh, the lion here as well. And so what, you really, what she was really saying is that we need to buy, um, buy African-American, like buy black. And that's the first thing she was kind of thinking about. And so she, she was kind of revolutionary in the thought process in terms of how she felt about, okay, we need to make sure our dollars are being represented. She fought for racial, educational, and gender equality. As you can see in front of these pictures, there's always young people and there's always a lot of women. And what she said was, and she said this all the time, it is an awful thing to hide our talent in the ground and refuse to work it. And she was like, if you're willing to work, you need to um, understand how to work. And what she, what she also thought was this, is that when the African-American race were under oppression, the African-American female was under it even more. And so she thought that, okay, I need to make sure that our African-American sisters are, um, are employed and, and working. Uh, I remember P P uh, President Obama said in 2014, uh, when women succeed, America succeeds. And that's true. And that's true. And she believed in that. Uh, here it says that she's a co-founder of the Richmond chapter of the NLACP and a council of colored women. She was in a lot of philanthropic activities that we're going to see going forward. And she was always just trying to bring the community together uh, through, through finances. She's involved in the civil rights movements and women's rights uh, to vote in, in 19, 1920, because the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote or giving folks the right to vote was in uh, 1919. She also gave the uh, industrial home for wayward girls and supported the anti-lynching movement because she was always trying to help women, the race, and children go forward. And this is just one of her cards that uh, she had earned as she worked on the uh, labor organization. I want to show you, I'm going to show you just a real short uh, video because I want you to see how Yahoo Finance kind of remembers her, even though you may not have heard her, heard about her. And Yahoo Finance is highlighting the achievements of black men and women, pioneers and difference makers in the fields of business and finance, as well as tech. Yahoo Finance's Reggie Wade joins us now from the newsroom with more on the African-American woman who changed the state of banking in the middle of Jim Crow. Adam, thank you. Yes, Maggie L. Walker was a business pioneer in every sense of the word. She was born about a year before the end of the Civil War to a former slave, and she was the first African-American woman and first woman to charter and become president of a bank in the United States. She not only started a bank, she started in 1905 a department store called the St. Luke Emporium to help people in the black community buy cheaper priced goods. In 1932, she helped start the first black, all black Girl Scout troop and her bank was the longest black owned bank in history. It stood black owned until 2005 when it merged with Abigail Adams Bank. So she was truly a pioneering woman and her statue actually depicts her checkbook in her hand in Richmond. Her home was turned into a historical site and it is a great place for anyone who is interested in black history and American history really because this is a part of American history. All right, Reggie, and again, you can read about this, uh, Reggie's article posted to Yahoo Finance. Thank you. Uh, one of the reasons why I really like just this little clip, because uh, she's known in the financial circles more than just uh, Black History Month. I know it says it here, but she is, she is known, well known. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, prior to me doing this interview, I re doing this presentation, I really didn't know a whole lot about her. but. Um, she just, she just phenomenal. And we're going to talk about her house and all the other things they talked about as well. All right, real quick, I'm going to do just a real quick um, uh, synopsis recap. 
uh, as in a corner, she's on a she's on the, the cover of Forbes. She's on a corner of Forbes. That's just how much a baller she was. Okay, let's kind of run, run through this real quick. In 1899, she was elected to lead the Independent Order of St. Luke. In 1901, she laid out a plan for a conglomerate, a newspaper, a bank, and a store. In 1902, she started the newspaper. 1903, she started the, she started the bank. 1904, she opened the Emporium, which is a store in downtown Richmond. And also in 1904, she was busy that this year, she purchased her home in Jackson Ward, an exclusive neighborhood. Uh, it was called Quality Row. And only like the attorneys, doctors, bankers, ministers, and the elite actually lived there, only the elite, the elite. It was known as the Harlem of the South. Um, they were equating it to um, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Uh, they called it Black, Black Wall Street. I think they, they spoke about that, that last month uh, because there was so much money flowing through Jacksonville that they, they equated to that. And one of the reasons why um, like Greenville was so prosperous was because they said out of, out of every dollar that circulated through the community 31 times before it actually left. And if you can imagine it, you give it to me, I bought, I bought some shoes, and then I use that to pay my car note. It would just kept going on and on and on. And so that's why um, Greenwood was so financially affluent. And it was the same thing that was going on here. She stayed in an exclusive park called Quality Road. I wish I could live in a, you know, a neighborhood that's called Quality Row. But she was, she was very affluent, affluent. In 1904, she organized a boycott against the trolley company. We spoke about that. And then in 1920, after the given right to vote, uh, she ran a voter registration drive when she received the right to vote in 1999. And then in 1921, ran for a superintendent of public instructions of school. So after she got the vote, then she actually ran to, uh, to win. She didn't win. But you can see her body of work just from 1899 to 1921, just how uh, motivated she was to make sure that the African-American community was going forward. Like I said, she started the first Girl Scout troop uh, in 1932. You know, I was never a Boy Scout, but I, can, I just can't imagine uh, she actually started that a Girl Scout troop in, in the South. These are some of the friends that uh, visited her. And these are just a few. I didn't have a, uh, enough room to put everybody on there, but Booker T. Washington, uh, Mary Bethune, uh, Cookman from the Cookman College, HBCU, and W.E.B. Du Bois, they all visited her. And we're, we're gonna see why they did. Well, cool. well before we get there, um, during this time, uh, Russell, her son, accidentally shot and killed his father by mistake in 1915. Tragedy, tragedy struck. What happened is because they lived in, in a, such an affluent neighborhood, there had been a rash of uh, burglaries going around. And so he thought he saw somebody on the porch balcony and he fired when it was actually his father. And so you, you hear the, see the news articles, this is Grim Tragedy in Miss uh, Walker's home, Russell, E.T. Walker kills his own father in their home. And so it was a tragedy. It was devastating to, uh, to Maggie. And as you can imagine, uh, he, uh, he went to trial. She, he was found not guilty, but it affected him tremendously. He ended up uh, passing early from depression and alcoholism, obviously due to the death of uh, the mistaken identity of his father and the death of him. And so, uh, that was a, another tragedy that Ms. Walker had to bear in her life because uh, she lost her, uh, her father, her stepfather, when they found him uh, in the river past. And now, um, and, and he, she lost a son, his namesake, Armstead, and now she actually lost the father. But she was strong and she kept going. She kept going. She kept going. After, after, after the passing of her husband, uh, Maggie, her house on, on Lee Street, 110 Lee Street, she uh, renovated it from nine to 28 homes because she wanted to accommodate all the family. So she had all the family, um, their wives, some of the servants. And so she, she remodeled her nine uh, unit home to 28 
uh, unit home. And as you can see, that was her mother, her mother, uh, uh, Elizabeth right there. She passed in 19, uh, 1922, I believe it was. And these are some of the, some of the, um, the grandchildren of Maggie Walker. I want to show you just how great her house was. As you can see, like when all the dignitaries would come in, Booker T. Washington, Miss Bethune, and W. Du Bois, this is where they stayed. This is where they stayed. That was her, where, where the piano was at. She would come to entertain them. You can see them walk away, walking into the, to, to the foyer. Their library, she did a lot of entertaining uh, in her library because she loved books and reading. A lot of people were there. Uh, you can see the, um, the staircase there leading up to her bedroom. And around that corner was that same bookcase. And once you, uh, once you went upstairs, the middle bottom uh, picture, that was her actually her bedroom. That's nice. That's nice. <laughs> and then next door was next next to her was just sort of like a, a an eating area. But she had, like I said, she converted to 28, 28, uh, 28 rooms. Pretty nice, huh? And then remember, this is in the early 1900s. So when I hear people say that, um, you know, blacks weren't affluent back in the 1900s during the difficult times of Jim Crow, they were, they were. And I kind of want to bring this uh, to people's attention. In her later years, Maggie developed uh, diabetes. And so what she did was, I'll just tell you how great she was. She put an elevator in her house. She put an elevator in her house. I'll tell you guys right now, if I had an elevator in my house, I would call you guys over for a barbecue and a ride in my elevator. That's just how great that was. And this is way back in the day. Even that chair there had, had wheels on it because you couldn't walk up and down those, those steep stairs. And so as you can see her wheelchair in her later years, she was confined to a, to a wheelchair. But that's just how innovative she was. Even back in those days, she had, a, had an elevator in her house. And she was always smiling, always going. Uh, e even in her uh, weekend state with the diabetes, she was still traveling up and down the states, getting folks to uh, join the bank and just unity and bringing everybody together. She was very, very well known. Uh, I spoke to it earlier at the stock market in 1929. Uh, she was like, okay, I'm not going to have my bank go under. So what she did was she went and spoke to the few other African-American banks and consolidated into the Consolidated Bank and Trust, which she uh, was chairman for over 25 years. And that was the longest black owned bank all the way up until the 21st century. The interesting about her banks, even when she opened up her first bank, what she would tell the kids was, I want you to bring $1 and you can open up a, a savings account, any type of account you want. But what she was trying to do is condition them that you have to understand how money works, put money away into a bank, save. And so she was always teaching them. That's why you always see kids, you always see kids around her because she was always teaching them to grow to be financially independent and resourceful and unity. Sadly, um, after leading the, the, the bank for 26 years, uh, she passed in December 15, 1934. Thousands of people showed up to her funeral because she had helped out so many people. She had, she had given out so many loans so they can build homes and businesses and investment capital and finances and understanding just cars and property. And just, she was such a financial, um, genius institution in Richmond that when she ultimately passed, uh, it was just a just an outpouring of her. That's just a death certificate. And that was just one of the few articles that uh, they spoke about how she passed uh, at 8, 8.30 at night. Uh, I, have, I have a little, a short little video. I just want to show you um, about the gravesite. You can kind of see it. Let's see what we have here. So here we are at one of the four evergreen cemeteries at least four at least four we just spent we got we were, we were driving down down 64 got off the road turning to what we thought our computer said was evergreen cemetery turns out it was arthur ashe's evergreen cemetery which was serendipity i guess we got his coordinates but then 
We go into this Evergreen Cemetery, which is the four cemeteries at Evergreen. We're driving through, and based on the based on the directions that the guy back at the other cemetery had given us, by turning right at the blue tractor, we found Magdalena Walker's headstone and memorial. But we would not have found this if that guy hadn't told us about the blue tractor, <laughs> because this place is ridiculously overgrown. I mean, there's no wonder that people can't find their headstones in here. It's uh. A little crazy. Here is the founder. St. Luke's founder in the Juvenile Harbor. William H. Mitchell. I there are a lot of Mitchell. I mean, there are head headstones littered throughout this forest. Throughout it. So when you think that, you know, probably the, the last the last 80 years when the black middle class of Richmond was burying their dead out here, all this has happened. It's crazy. Maggie was part of the upper upper middle class. She was laid to rest uh, with Armstead as well as her mother at the same barrel pot. Now I'm, I believe that it's um, kept up a lot more and a lot better. But it's interesting just how history can be lost when a, a simple grave site isn't kept up. And so he was just happened to be out and about and ran across somebody as famous as Maggie Walker. But if you didn't know who she was, you wouldn't you just thought it was another headstone. So it's just important to know your history and to understand the significance of people throughout history. And that's one of the reasons why I do this Unveiled series. Um, and her legacy just continued to grow. The school was named, a school was named after her in 1939, but it was abandoned in 1990, but it reopened in 2001 as a governor's school for government and international studies. I think they were the dragons. But, and you can see a bus they put in front of her. But, you know, a lot of times we're traveling around the country, you'll see high schools and different names of people of high schools, and you may not even understand who they are. But if you kind of know your history and you understand uh, what they did doing history, you'll see Maggie L. Walker, and hopefully you say, hey, you know what, I, I know who she was, and she was a great woman for the community. They also have days of service for her, believe it or not, back in Virginia. She's a big deal back in the East Coast. It's just that we don't, I didn't hear a whole, about, whole much about her you know, on the West Coast. So I want you to see what they do in honor of her as well. Several Richmond organizations and nonprofits gathered today to celebrate the life and legacy of Maggie L. Walker with a day of service. Walker is most known for being the first woman in the nation to own a bank, as well as transforming black business practices. Volunteers celebrated Walker's 156th birthday by planting flowers and cleaning up around her statue. They also picked up litter in Jackson Ward and installed a new mural at Calhoun Community Center. Volunteers say she would be proud. To put your hands to the wheel, to the plow, and make the changes, make the differences, that would be so incredible for her. She would be very proud to see what we were doing here today. Mayor LeVar Stoney says Walker's legacy, legacy rather, is, quote, a reminder that we stand on the shoulders of giants and have a responsibility to lift up our community. I just thought that was just awesome, you know, and she's right. We, we do stand on the shoulders of giants, men, men and women. Her home, her home on Quality Road was actually turned into a historical site. So if you go to Richmond, Virginia and you're out sightseeing, you can actually go and tour her home. And um, I never thought about going to Virginia for a holiday or for some vacation, but I think I would now just to walk into her house and, and learn more about this amazing, amazing woman. It's a nice career, let me tell you. In 2017, 
uh, they had actually unveiling of her statue. And guess where it was? Right in the middle of Broad Street and back in the day, after Americans couldn't even go, or they had to go and get out of it. And as you can see that uh, her, um, the newspaper says honoring, honoring greatness, thousands and thousands of people showed up. And that was a statue that they made of her. And so in a corner, what you can see is that they made her statue with her checkbook in her hand. Now, how great is that? I was thinking, okay, if I have a statue, you know, what would be what would be in my hand? I'm thinking, I don't know, maybe a ham sandwich or something, you know. <laughs> I can see somebody saying, uh, hey, I see James the statue and he has a burrito in it, you know, in his hand. But um, I just thought that was so apropos that they thought about her and what she actually thought about that she walked with a uh, checkbook in her hand. In, in a corner there, you see that the young lady name? Uh, her name is Elizabeth. Uh, she was the great granddaughter, one of the great, great, great granddaughters of Maggie, uh, Maggie Walker. And so she was there doing this unveiling. And so I kind of want you guys to show you just a quick little view of how it looked when they actually unveiled the first statue. great is that? I never even knew they had a statue of Maggie Walker. Um, someone great. And, it, and I like that they're honoring her in her home state, in her hometown, uh, where at one time African Americans couldn't even go. And as you can see, just for a little view, there are, there are hundreds, there are thousands of people there. There are thousands of people there, all up in the windows and all around. It, it, it was a great day. It was a great day. You know, they, they, have, they have plaques up, you go around, you can see her plaques, and they even have a, a, a street named after her. You're walking down the street, you see Maggie L. Walker, okay, I, I kind of know who she is. And it's like, once again, uh, I just love that picture of her walking with the checkbook in hand. She about business, she about business. <laughs> you know, uh, on her final words, um, when she, before she passed, she was in her home, uh, surrounded by all of her family. And the last thing she said was, she said, have faith, have courage and carry on. And that's what she always wanted to make sure that the race understood that you can, you have to have faith in difficult times. And you know, seeing that she went through a lot of uh, difficult times, you have to have courage, go beyond yourself and have visions of, and her vision was unity and a bank and a, and a store and a newspaper, but you have to carry on even though things make it tough because you're really uh, carrying on for your next generation. And I just thought those were all great lessons that she taught from her story, you know? And so she was a true, true American icon. She is. She was a bank president, owned a department store. She's an entrepreneur, seven no men there, owned a bank, civil rights fighter, owned newspaper, and so much, so much, so much more. You know, she was truly an American, uh, legend. And just because of her clothes, her house, and her car, she set a great example to uh, the African-American community that you can, uh, you can achieve if you understand, one, how money works, finances, and if you work together in cooperation with each other. I think one of the quotes that she said, we can do anything just as soon as we learn the lesson of unity. I'm going to say that one more time. She stated, we can do anything just as soon as we learn the lesson of unity. And I just thought that was just powerful. If we could all learn the lesson of unity, what could we or what couldn't we achieve? You know, and she was a true legend. And I was so happy to have the opportunity to, um, to understand her and research her and find out about her. And I wish I would have known about her years ago. But that's my time for tonight. 
This has been Maggie Walker Unveiled. I hope you enjoyed the, the presentation. Uh, I believe at this time we're going to have a uh, short question and answer period. And I think Ms. Charmaine is going to. Uh, have any questions? Let me know. Thank you so much, James. That was wonderful. Very, very interesting to uh, learn about Maggie Walker and learn something new. Um, does anyone have any questions? And if you do, feel free to put them in the chat box or you can unmute your microphone. Oh, uh, I have a question. James, this is hey, Stan. Stan. How you doing? Okay. <laughs> hey, listen, <laughs> this is a great presentation. Dynamic lady. And, and you know, we could use a lot more out there, right? Amen. Uh, I would have loved to have been a student under her. Me and too. I, I think I would have uh, I learned a lot more on how to handle my finances <laughs> and also uh, realistically working with the youth. Um, man, that's a, that's a great thing she's done in the past, as well as a number of other things that she was doing. But James, how did you come about this? I mean, how did it send out for you to find her anyway? That, that's a great question. Actually, uh, when I've done my other unveiled uh, presentations, I always ask and solicit for, if you, if you, if you know someone who, um, who you think would be interesting, let me know. And so I had a friend, uh, and believe it or not, she was Caucasian. She said, James, I think there's some, someone that you may want to uh, you know, read about or learn about or research. I said, okay, okay. And the minute, the minute I latched onto it, I was like, okay, this, this lady needs to be put into the forefront because not a lot of people even know about her. I, I didn't know about her. Right. And I just wanted to bring her, bring her out. Oh boy, wow. Thank you, Stan. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, James, I have a question. This is Anna. Hey, Anna. Hi. Yeah, um, how did you compile all of the, the, the pictures, the video and all of those things? How'd you get all of that together? Ooh, you want my secrets, girl? Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just just uh, a lot of research. Um, and it's, it's interesting because I, you guys probably didn't notice, but on her headstone, one of her headstones, it says she was born in uh, 1967 and passed in, in 1934. When actually she was born in, I mean, 1867. We actually she was born in 1864. And so there's a lot of competing and misinformation uh, about her. Because a lot of times records weren't kept, you know, up to date, the whole nine yards. So I had to go back and just do a lot of uh, research and cross-checking and uh, whether it be books, newspapers, clippings, everything to try to come up with a cohesive, cohesive um, presentation. The thing about, about Maggie is that she is so expansive. I could have went to a, a, a ton of different directions, but I just wanted to give everybody at least a flavor of how great she really was, someone that you may not have even known. So that's why I just want to unveil her. Good question, though. Yeah, I mean, how did you find her gravestone? Was that online, or what, you know? I believe, you... I believe, I believe it's online. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good, huh? Yeah, yeah, that was really good. I thought you were down there and you know <laughs> <laughs> checking things out. That was great. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. So yeah, so um, uh, Maggie is just, a, just an in interesting character and uh, I you take a time to look on her, to, to look her up. I was looking for a book and just how rare her book is. I think one book was like $149. Oh my gosh. So yeah. someone has written her, bio her biography or? I don't know if it's, a, if it's a biography, but I know it's a book about her. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. So there's, there's not a whole lot of information out there in terms of books, but there should be. Maybe you can write one, Anna. <laughs> I don't, no, I don't think so. You did, you, you, you know, you got it covered. That is fantastic. You really got it covered. I love it. Hi, James. This is Brenda. Hey, Brenda, how you doing? Good, good. I had a question. Um, do we know what happened to Polly? No, we don't. No, we don't. Um, I didn't search that hard down a rabbit hole for her. But uh, yeah, I, I didn't actually find out her uh, date of uh, when she passed. Oh, okay. Good question. Thank you. Great job. Yeah. Great job. Oh, thank you. You guys are too kind. Thank you. James, Greg. Oh, hey, Greg. Hey, uh, 
good presentation, man. I uh, really enjoyed it. And I had never heard anything about her. So it was uh, enlightening for me. And, you know, I was kind of curious because of how progressive she was back then. And I, I didn't hear anything about white backlash. And mm. I was wondering if, well, I'm sure that there was some, but uh, it didn't seem to stop her or get in the way. She overcame that if, you know, if there actually was one or well, was some, which I'm pretty <laughs> sure there was, you know, a lot of jealous people out there. But I have, a, I have another question. I saw she, her on the cover of a, um, a magazine, American Legacy. Now, mm -hmm. was that something that she produced or was that uh, a later magazine that was out there? Is it still around or what do you know about it? I believe, I believe it was a late, uh, later magazine. Um, I didn't actually see if she, I don't think she produced it because uh, her company had, had closed by then. Okay. Um, but yeah, but no. Uh, but as an answer to your, to your first question about was her backlash, you know, like you said, absolutely. As a matter of fact, when she opened her store in downtown Broad Street, because blacks couldn't go in the front door, had to go through the back. Uh, what what the African um, I mean what the uh, Caucasian owners would do they would threaten the African Americans that said that if you continue going to you know Maggie's store uh, we're going to you know promote violence or yeah you can't, you can't buy here at whole nine yard so ultimately the store uh, went out of business after after a while just because of the backlash of you know folks not you know supporting it. Because not because they didn't want to, because they were afraid of facing, facing violence, and that's why I said that quote when she says that you know you have to um, stop feeding the lion of race prejudice. Yeah, you can defeat them because that was her mindset. Because she saw she saw what was going on at the time. Yeah, but she kept pushing. She kept pushing them. She kept pushing. Yeah, yeah, man, great story. Oh, yeah, thank you, great. Thank, thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, Dale, this is Mary Houston. Hey, Mary. Okay, great presentation oh, on thank you. phenomenal woman. I was just so uh, enlightened. Job well done. My thank question you, to you is, I mean, this woman just, she had greatness throughout, yeah. her, D, throughout her DNA. And I know usually that's passed down you know, through the bloodline, you know, and I like to know, is there anything known about, you know, maybe her grandchildren or any of her descendants, you know, following in her footsteps or, or you know, uh, achieving great things as, they're, they're, as, as she did or something any sim similar to anything that she did or were inspired about her endeavors? Yeah, I was looking at her lineage and there, there is a lot of activism in her lineage. And especially okay. uh, the last one, uh, her name is Elizabeth um, Randolph Walker. She uh, works down in Richmond now uh, with the city council trying to get you know, things done because she was like her last granddaughter. So yeah, her whole lineage, there are people just always fighting and trying to uplift because if you know anything about Richmond, Virginia, you know, if we talk about the monuments that they were trying to take down, it took them years to fight to get this monument up. And, mm -hmm. she, was part, and, she, and she was part of that effort. She was part of that mm -hmm. effort. And she's a young girl. Okay. Thank you. No, thank you for coming on, Mary. I appreciate it. She's an old boss. I appreciate you, Mary. <laughs> <laughs> so James, who's your next person? Who's your next project? That's a good question. I have a, I have a few, I have a few on the um, calendar I'm kind of, I'm kind of looking at. Uh, it usually takes me about six months mm. to kind of put together and decide who I want. Uh, I don't, I don't want to give away quite yet, but uh, uh, hopefully um, I'll have it ready to go soon. But what I, I but I, I, what I do want to thank is um, the Mineral Valley Library mm. for hosting me tonight because it's what July thirteenth, mm -hmm. and what they do is they recognize that there may be an audience for. Uh, positive African-American programming other than February. That's good. And so I appreciate 
everyone coming on because that shows that there is. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, because sometimes in February, there's so many things going on, there's, there's competing and you may miss something. And I, I, I just truly believe that uh, African-American stories, history should be taught all throughout the whole year because it happened throughout the whole year, it just didn't happen in February. And so right. I appreciate the library and I appreciate everyone for taking time out your day today to just log on and just hear about a phenomenal woman. Thank you. That's great. Great. Everything was great. It's James. Right. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is your sister, Gail. Hey, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> I have the question. I, I think you made mention of how much the bank made um, when she took over, you, you mentioned something like a million dollars or something. Yeah. Um, but can you uh, tell me how much that would have equated to what we make, what a million dollars is in today's money? Yeah, I had, I had thought about the uh, inflation rate. Um, as a matter of fact, I thought about that. Uh, she had made, um, she, she grew it up to, I think, uh, half a million dollars in the bank at one time, but over her lifetime, it was about 3.5 million that she had coming in. That would probably equate to something like, um, I think it's around 10 million now with the rate of inflation. You know, she was doing some phenomenal stuff back in, back in, uh, in Virginia. And I love, I love the little kids. They're always um, well-dressed and you know, they could actually start a, start a bank account. I remember when I, I started my first bank account, you know, it was a big deal. It taught me to talk, talk about money. So yeah, she was uh, really instrumental in that. And she just kept raising, raising income, yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate you, appreciate you. <laughs> okay. Um, Anyone else have any other questions or anything to add for James? You can talk to me. Don't worry, I won't bite. <laughs> I wanted to uh, show you just two more things before we leave. Um, I'm working on a new book. It's called Natalie's Newscast. And Maggie Walker, she's going to be in this book, this story. What Natalie is, is that she, um, she interviews famous people from the past. And with her magic microphone, Mia, and her dog, uh, her camera dog, Lucy, when she puts the mic up to, up to um, a statue or a picture or a museum or anything in a museum or anything historical, it comes to life and she tells, you know, she interviews them about their story. And so she's going, so one of the stories in Natalie's newscast is um, Maggie Walker. And so I'm gonna have it available on, you know, regular books as well as audio. And audio is going to be uh, done by Angela Ross, An Angela Rush Russian Ross of the SoCal Voices podcast, Angela Ross. If you get an opportunity, um, log on to her podcast. She does a great job. But she's going to be voicing um, Natalie. So I'm looking forward to that. So kind of keep your ear out when my next book is uh, coming out. I'm still working on Corey, but I'm also working on Natalie as well. I love the Natalie series. This is real. <laughs> I love oh. the Natalie series. And this was very enlightening. Thank you. Thank you, Rose, for, for coming on. Uh, Rose is part of my uh, creative writing class. And so before I actually put it in a book, I actually read, it to, I read, read the stories to my class. And so she was there and she heard uh, me read the story about uh, uh, Maggie Walker. Obviously, I couldn't put the detail in a children's story as I could in the presentation, but they will still get the flavor of somebody, hopefully that they'd want to, want to know about. Um, if anybody wants to know anything more about me or contact me or you have any questions later, um, here's my contact information. You can email me or call me or Instagram me or anything and uh, we can talk. If you have some, have some ideas, Anna does a good job of bringing me uh, different people that she, I may want to, um, I may want to research and kind of do an unveiled on. If you have somebody you think, hey, you know, I think this is somebody that we need to know, go ahead and just uh, please contact me, call me, and I'll take a look at it and kind of go from there. I just want to thank everybody for showing up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Yes, sir. James, Greg again. 
I was Today. just looking at uh, the book that you're going to start working on or started working on, uh, Natalie's newscast. Mm -hmm. my, my niece is a newscaster. She works with CNN and she's um, uh, in the president's press corps. Mm -hmm. So okay. I mean, wow. if, if you, uh, you know, she, I don't know how busy she is. I don't get to see her very often. Okay. Uh, Okay, but uh, you know, she, I'm sure if, if she could do something to help you, and she has the time, she would be more than happy to do it. That'd be great. What's her name? Her name is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> don't 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 worry about it because uh, I can always change the name <laughs> from, from, from Natalie's to her name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank, no, thank, uh, thank you, Greg. I, I appreciate the offer. Thank you. I'll definitely take you up on it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I'll give you that information uh, if I see you Friday. Okay. Uh, we are, uh, Greg, Greg's my golf buddy. <laughs> we play golf yeah. on Friday. So. <laughs> All right. Take care. Take care, Greg. And hey, and thanks again. That was, that was uh, real nice. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Appreciate you. Right. Appreciate you, man. Okay. Take care. All right, James. I'm going to sign off. So, okay. Hey, great work. Thank you. Uh, see you in class. See you in class. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Okay. So, you see you next, next presentation. <laughs> yeah, okay. This is Ray. Oh, okay, Ray. How you doing? Oh, man. Good. <laughs> thank you for logging on. Appreciate you. Excellent job as always. I appreciate every time you enlighten us with a history that we really never thought about or seen. So I just wanted to uh, give a little shout out to you and, and thank you for doing what you do. Uh, I believe God is really using you to uh, unveil these things to us. And uh, I just appreciate you as my friend and, and uh, as actually my uh, professor of history these days, <laughs> it seems like. And uh, keep doing the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you for the encouragement. I need it. Thank you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you. We'll talk about it more over dinner. All right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Okay. So we'll see everybody at the next Unveiled. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you for your time. And thank you, James. Thank you. Thank you, Charmaine. I appreciate you. You're welcome.